everyone. Thanks for uh, spending your lunch hour with me. My name is Kristen Tappenden. I'm a geotechnical engineer, as was mentioned, um, with the Department of Transportation and Economic Corridors here in Alberta. I'm based out of the Technical Standards Branch in Edmonton, so thanks for the opportunity to present virtually to you today. I'll be sharing a bit about how our department manages geohazard risks along the Alberta Highway Network and our future vision for geotechnical asset management. So I'm going to be speaking today about a consulting study we recently accomplished in partnership with TetraTech with the objective of developing a geotechnical asset management framework for Alberta transportation and applying this framework to a pilot scale subset of our geotechnical sites. So before getting started, I do want to acknowledge the folks at Tetra Tech Engineering led by Gary St. Michel and Afsal Wazim out of Vancouver, and also Roger Skiro, the director of our geotechnical group. Uh, he's been involved with Alberta's geohazard risk management program for over 20 years now. So in 2020, Alberta Transportation issued a request for proposal for engineering consulting services to support the transformation of our current geohazard risk management program into a geotechnical asset management program. And I'll begin the presentation today by touching on the range of geotechnical issues we manage in Alberta and what we've accomplished so far through our geohazard risk management program. I'll then speak to the work that we undertook in partnership with Tetra Tech to develop a framework for managing our geohazard sites as geotechnical assets. I'll then close with some brief highlights from the pilot scale implementation of that study and the future vision of how we might apply asset management principles to our geotechnical sites throughout Alberta. So Alberta's provincial highway network comprises more than 28,000 kilometers of paved highways, approximately 4,800 bridges, and 500 documented geohazard sites. These include natural hazards and constructed earthworks. So these big three asset classes that I'm showing on the screen are the main subjects of our department's transportation asset management plan, which was completed in 2020. So my presentation today on geotechnical asset management is situated within this broader context of a department-wide initiative around maturing our asset management practices. And while in Canada we don't have any mandated requirements for asset management reporting, one of the key objectives outlined in our department's annual business plan is the use of asset management principles to support strategic decision making for our capital investments. So by way of setting the context, what sorts of geotechnical issues do we deal with along the highway network in Alberta? Well, let me take you on a bit of a tour. So in Northwest Alberta, Peace River, Grand Prairie districts, we see many deep seated valley wall landslides, which may be inactive, dormant or actively moving. And by virtue of the geomorphology, these tend to be ductile failures that are extremely to very slow moving but are highly destructive and expensive to repair by virtue of their size. In North Central Alberta, Edson, Athabasca areas, we often encounter embankment failures where construction of the highway has traversed over soft, wet ground, especially muskeg conditions. In general, in Central Alberta, many of our geohazard sites are located in the Drumheller area, the Badlands where semi-arid conditions and dispersive soils conspire to create a variety of deep erosion, gullies, and subsidence issues. And in Southern Alberta, as we get closer to the Rocky Mountains, we encounter many rockfall hazards along the natural and constructed highway back slopes. So our department's strategic mandate is to provide a safe and efficient transportation system to support Alberta's economic, social, and environmental vitality. And in support of this mandate, our geohazard risk management program was established in 1999. So under this program, we're responsible for overseeing the monitoring and management of approximately 500 identified geohazard sites throughout the province. And of course, this is an incomplete inventory. These are sites that have been brought to our attention as um, presenting risk to the highway safety and efficiency. 
Now, 250 of these sites are currently active, meaning they do pose ongoing risk to the safe and efficient operation of Alberta's highways. And with the help of our engineering consultants, all of the active geohazard sites in our inventory are inspected on an annual or biannual basis, typically. Approximately half of our geohazard sites are also instrumented. Uh, we have nearly 700 standpipes and pisometers being actively read throughout the province, about 418 slope inclinometers, and approximately 250 other instruments that we're monitoring. Most of these are associated with instrumentation to monitor the performance of pile walls that have been constructed for landslide stabilization. So these include things like tieback anchor load cells, strain gauges, shape accelerates, and others. While in the future we're interested in deploying more innovative monitoring and remote sensing technologies, we do currently rely primarily on conventional in situ instrumentation for characterizing our geohazard sites. So based on those annual field inspections and instrumentation readings, each geohazard site in our program is assigned a risk level rating on a scale of 1 to 200. And the risk level at each site is defined as the product of the probability factor multiplied by the consequence factor. So these risk level ratings allow for relative prioritization of our geohazard sites for our capital repair program which receives an annual funding of approximately $15 million per year. However, the risk level does not provide any economic information such as cost of anticipated travel delays or number of vehicles that would be affected by a potential geohazard disruption. Nor does it allow us to compare with other projects vying for funding such as a bridge replacement or a pavement overlay, for example. So that leads to some of the challenges we're currently facing in communicating the importance of our geohazard repairs to decision makers. We're frequently being asked to quantify the impact of candidate projects using economic metrics. Um, capital investment decisions are becoming increasingly centralized and there's a heightened awareness around demonstrating return on investment between different asset classes, such as prioritizing geotechnical projects against a pavement rehabilitation or a bridge replacement. And there's also an increasing need to forecast future condition and advocate for long-term funding required to maintain our geotechnical sites in a state of good repair. So historically, geohazards have often been treated as an unpredictable liability to agency operations, and in many cases, they can be ignored until failure forces unplanned action. The impacts of this approach are that you have direct repair costs, which are higher for emergency situations than for programmed work. You also have indirect costs associated with prolonged road closures and reduced efficiency while emergency design and construction takes place. And there's an implicit acceptance of an unknown level of risk. So part of optimizing and advocating for investments in geotechnical sites means quantifying the benefits of timely interventions compared to this reactive approach. So that leads us into asset management. Um, asset management, if you're not familiar, allows you to take that proactive posture in the way that you're framing geohazard threats to the highway network. So asset management is defined by AASHTO as a strategic and systematic process of operating, maintaining, upgrading, and expanding physical assets effectively throughout their life cycle. So it focuses on better decision making based on quality information and well defined objectives. It's about making those decisions that serve the public, consider the full life cycle costs, and demonstrate value for investment. Transportation asset management basically lies at that interface between engineering and economics. Now, in the United States, transportation asset management has been mandated since 2012. So in order to qualify for federal funding, all U.S. state departments of transportation 
are required to submit asset management plans for their bridges and pavements on the national highway system. So this has been spurring research and development into transportation asset management be best practice, not just for bridges and pavements, but for geotechnical earth assets as well. So in 2019, the U.S. National Cooperative Highway Research Program, NCHRP, published this report 903, which is an implementation guide for transportation agencies looking to get started with geotechnical asset management. And the purpose of TetraTech's consulting assignment with us was to adapt these leading NCHRP recommendations to the Alberta context and to customize the accompanying GAM planner spreadsheet tool for our use, deploying it to a pilot scale inventory of 25 of our sites. So the project was really a collaborative undertaking between Alberta Transportation and TetraTech. The workflow closely followed that NCHRP report, which includes developing a taxonomy for consistent classification of the geotechnical assets in our inventory, measures of asset condition and consequences of adverse performance, analytical tools to forecast changes in condition over time, and investment analyses to estimate treatment costs and prioritize candidate projects while communicating future needs. So the primary innovation that Tetra Tech brought to the project relates to the monetization of risk which was not explicitly incorporated in the NCHRP study, but which I'll speak to later in the presentation. So to begin, how do we define geotechnical assets? The relevant ISO standard defines an asset as an item, thing, or entity that has potential or actual value to an organization. It can be tangible or intangible, financial or non-financial, and it includes consideration of risks and liabilities. So with that in mind, both geohazards and constructed earthworks can be considered geotechnical assets in the sense that future capital expenditures are required to maintain or repair these sites. Our geotechnical sites do play a crucial role in the functioning of Alberta's transportation network, and these same sites also pose potential threats to the transportation system as a result of deteriorating condition, escalating maintenance costs, or catastrophic failures. So from an agency risk management perspective, geohazards and constructed earthworks can generate similar risks to our infrastructure and their performance needs to be proactively managed to achieve our ministry objectives of highway safety and efficiency. So the first step in our study was to agree on consistent terminology or taxonomy for classifying our geotechnical assets. And Scott Anderson published a paper in 2016 which organizes geotechnical assets into these four broad categories, slopes, embankments, retaining walls, and subgrades. So Anderson's taxonomy of geotechnical assets was used in that NCHRP report, and it was also our starting point. We then proposed that each asset could be further described as natural versus constructed, then by its material composition, and finally uh, by its controlling behavior. So this classification allows you to identify the assets in your inventory, and it can also be used to apply unique deterioration models to the different types of assets, as we'll see in a minute here. So our next task in the study was to examine how we can measure the condition and performance of these geotechnical assets. Our goal was to explicitly quantify and monetize the risk that a particular asset poses to highway safety and efficiency. So with that in mind, we modified Alberta's geohazard risk rating system, which I had previously showed, into this five-level risk-based geotechnical asset management rating system in alignment with that NCHRP report. So the condition descriptors essentially range from very good to very poor, where you have 
in a very good condition, minor defects suggesting that a highway disruption resulting from the asset performance would be a rare occurrence to very poor where we're seeing widespread high severity distress where the asset is no longer functioning as intended and a highway service disruption is imminent. So this is captured in the estimated mean time between adverse events that you see across the top of the screen there. Taking it a step further, we can calculate the annualized probability of disruption in any given year using the equation shown, where T is that time between adverse events in years. So this allows us to quantify the likelihood of disruption in any given year based on the current condition of the asset. So now we don't just have relative condition descriptors, we have an estimated quantitative probability of disruption, which is expressed as a percentage. And on the consequence side of the risk equation, we worked on developing, again, a rating scale with five categories that would allow us to monetize the consequences associated with the adverse performance of a geotechnical asset. So we focused on characterizing the number of traffic lanes that would likely be impacted and the duration of delay or for an event rendering the full highway impassable, what would be the length and duration of the detour. So for example, does the failure of a soil slope below the highway threaten one lane of a multi-lane corridor or does it force a full closure of the highway and for how long? So we had to make some assumptions about the duration of each type of consequence based on how long that delay or detour might typically remain in place until maintenance actions or engineering design and reconstruction can be completed. So once we've estimated that annualized probability of disruption, which is expressed as a percentage, we can multiply this by the expected consequences in dollars to arrive at the annualized monetized risk for each site in the inventory. So Tetra Tech included the unit costs for 80 different treatments into the spreadsheet tool for us using Alberta's database of unit price averages for recent projects. And as shown in this table, the monetary value of owner consequence at any particular site depends on the degree of intervention that's required from maintenance to reconstruction. So that GAM planner spreadsheet tool uses a linear equation solver to determine the optimal treatment for the site in order to minimize the costs over time. And similarly, the monetary value of user consequence will depend on how the adverse asset performance will affect users in terms of additional time, fuel, vehicle maintenance, and accident costs associated with that delay or detour. So here's a sampling of those costs calculated for one of the sites in the pilot study. So I'd like to share an example of how we could consider applying this concept of monetized risk to one of our sites located on Highway 40 north of the town of Hinton. So Highway 40 is an important economic corridor for Northwest Alberta. It's the only major highway between Hinton and Grand Prairie. This particular section was constructed as a side hill fill on a valley wall approximately 50 meters above the Athabasca River. So it's a steep and deep valley side slope below the highway with a back slope cut above the road and not much room on either side. The valley wall below the roadway embankment is failing into the Athabasca River, putting the highway at risk. And the, here's the interesting part. The length of the detour, if this critical corridor was closed, is 167 kilometers. So in the event that this slope fails and results in a full road closure, that's a nearly two hour detour on a highway with 1,200 vehicles a day, of which 25% is commercial traffic. Here's a photo of the valley wall below the highway, which is marked uh, by the dashed line. And here you can see the back scarp of the landslide retrogressing to within several meters of the highway. 
and it is deteriorating quite quickly. You can see the amount of degradation that took place between May and October in 2020. So how would we go about attempting to quantify and communicate to decision makers the level of risk that this situation presents to Alberta's highway network and the benefits of intervening proactively before the slide impacts the highway? Let's consider the scenario where the failure of the slope below the highway forces a full closure of the road. This would correspond to a severe service disruption or full detour scenario with a likelihood of occurrence that we judge to be probable. If we wait for failure to force unplanned action, the user costs of taking that 167 kilometer detour, even for three months while emergency design and reconstruction takes place, are a substantial $15 million. The owner cost of a failure would be an estimated 2 million reconstruction cost plus a 20% premium for emergency construction compared to planned work. So if we take the sum of those user and owner consequences and multiply them by that annualized probability of failure, we'll take the 18% at the low end of the range, we come up with an annual monetized risk of about $3.1 million. This can be compared to an estimated $2.1 million in owner and user costs for a planned intervention. This would involve realignment of the highway into the back slope, allowing one lane of traffic to remain open during construction. So at a site like this one where the consequences of simply running to failure before intervening are high, we can clearly demonstrate the value of programming a proactive intervention. Now, beyond the current condition of our geotechnical assets, it's also important to be able to forecast changes in condition over time and the resulting impacts to our highway network. So to illustrate this concept, I put together this photo compilation showing the deterioration of a slope adjacent to Highway 744 near the town of Peace River, Alberta. So these photos were collected as part of our geohazard site inspections over the years. And you can see a dramatic change in the condition of the slope and the risk that it poses to the adjacent highway over the 10 year period between 2009 to 2019. And the highway you see visible there on the ridge in the upper right hand side of the image. So the NCHRP GAM Planner Spreadsheet tool implements Markov deterioration models for forecasting the expected performance of the asset inventory into future years. So this table, as an example, shows a Markov deterioration model for soil slopes that was originally developed by the Alaska DOT through expert elicitation. The transition time is the estimated number of years that it takes for 50% of a representative population of assets to deteriorate from one condition state to the next worst one. So matrix multiplication can basically be used to apply these types of models to the assets in your inventory year over year to project the condition to any future time based on the current state. And several different Markov deterioration models are incorporated into the spreadsheet tool for the different types of geotechnical assets. And as part of our pilot study, TetraTech was able to utilize them for extending this concept of monetized risk out over a 50 year timeline. So based on the Markov deterioration models, the unit price averages, they've quantified the benefit cost ratio for us for intervention. So the benefit is the reduction in monetized risk over a 50 year horizon compared to the due minimum or base case scenario. And the cost of course is the present value of the recommended treatment applied in the optimal year. So our pilot study, as I mentioned, included applying the framework to 25 of our geohazard sites and a sampling of those BCR results are shown here. So in the yellow column, you can see the 50 year benefit cost ratios in terms of reduction in monetized risk, provide good differentiation between those top five candidate geotechnical projects. 
This BCR calculation could also potentially be deployed for cross comparison with other capital projects, such as a bridge replacement or highway rehabilitation, for example. Those Markov deterioration models at an aggregated level can also be used to provide an inventory level picture of how different funding scenarios would impact on the future needs and condition of your portfolio. So the first set of charts here uh, is produced by that spreadsheet tool again is, and is for an annual funding level of one and a half million dollars applied to those 25 sites in the pilot study while this second set of charts uh, represents an annual funding level of 300, uh, three, pardon me, $3 million applied to those 25 sites. So we've yet to deploy this tool to our full inventory, but in so doing, we can clearly demonstrate the value of increased investment in terms of improving the overall condition of our geotechnical inventory and reducing this long-term burden of deferred need while managing our assets to their lowest life cycle cost. So these sorts of high level scenarios are the pictures we'd like to bring to our executive team in order to advocate for the investment required to maintain our inventory of geotechnical sites in a state of good repair. Now to tie it all together, TetraTech fully customized that GAM planner spreadsheet tool that came with the NCHRP report. They provided this interface for our use uh, that you see here, which includes highway specific traffic volumes, detour lengths, treatment options and costs, calculation of monetized risk, and that 50 year benefit cost ratio for interventions. So the workbook that TetraTech prepared allows you to enter assets into your inventory with length and location information. It also allows you to choose the appropriate asset classification for deterioration modeling and unit price calculations. And based on your site inspections, you can enter current probability factors and consequence factors to calculate that annualized monetized risk. Again, based on the highway specific traffic volumes, detour lengths and asset specific unit prices for interventions. The tool will determine the optimal intervention type and year and the 50 year benefit cost ratio of that treatment. And there's various ways of viewing the information produced for your inventory, including this dashboard summary. So as I mentioned, we have yet to deploy this to our full inventory of geotechnical sites beyond those 25 locations um, that were included in the pilot study. But the results that we're finding from that study are useful and promising. The finished project was also recently honored with an award of merit by the Consulting Engineers of Alberta in the category of Studies, Software and Special Services. So to conclude, in its current form, Alberta's Geohazard Program provides necessary inputs to some aspects of asset management, such as a partial asset inventory, and relative prioritization of those sites for intervention, but it doesn't facilitate forecasting future needs nor comparison with other capital projects vying for funding. The geotechnical asset management pilot study modeled after the NCHRP report and conducted in partnership with TetraTech aligns with our department's transportation asset management plan. And we intend to begin deploying the pilot study findings to enhance our ability to quantify the condition and deterioration of our geotechnical assets, to forecast future funding requirements, and to facilitate evidence-based decision-making that really considers that full life cycle cost and benefit of investing in our geotechnical assets. So we're currently envisioning that this future full-scale deployment of the asset management framework would be accomplished within a modern geospatial software platform. 
which the department is currently investigating as part of our innovation initiatives. With that, I just want to thank you for your attention. I'd be pleased uh, to take questions, Jack, if you have some in the Q&A. And also feel free to connect with me at the email address shown there. Thanks.